Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Stories from the Strong Room. In this episode, we're going to explore the arts and crafts items held at the Hull History Centre. But wait, I hear you say, aren't objects such as craft pieces usually held by museums rather than archives? Well, yes, they usually are, but some, like scrapbooks, are a natural fit for archives, whilst other objects are retained within their related manuscript collection at the discretion of the archivist. The inspiration for this video was my own keen personal interest in arts and crafts. My crafting hobby encompasses a lot of different areas, including painting, sewing, card making and model making, although I can't claim to be very good at any of them. I find crafting can be relaxing and also satisfying. Making something with your own hands from scratch can be very fulfilling even if the end result is not always as perfect as you might like. Creative hobbies, now big business, from well-known superstores dedicated to crafting to the proliferation of online sellers of handmade wares. But crafting, creating, painting, marking and recording events has long been a human instinct, going as far back as when we were painting images on cave walls. With this in mind, I was intrigued to see what arts and crafts items I could discover in the archives, what had been created, recorded and kept by our ancestors and found their way into our stores. One of the first and most fascinating items I came across was at reference UDX324. Amongst some genealogical papers relating to the Courtney family of Beverly were some needlework samples belonging to a Mary Smelt who had married into the Courtneys. The needlework items included a pincushion attached to a ribbon as though it were to be worn as a necklace, a hand-sewn bracelet with the embroidered motto, idleness is the mother of mischief, and a small needle case. Curiosity piqued, I investigated the other papers in the file. These papers contain entertaining details of the creation of the most noble order of the needle, formed in 1761 by a group of young girls and ladies as a means of amusing themselves. The order was led by a grand mistress and detailed instructions have survived for the installation of a lady companion. The installation appears to have been a grand affair with a procession and formal investiture ceremony. The grand mistress and companions were to wear specially created scarves and hoods, as well as a collar, bracelet and pincushion of the order, presumably similar to those that survive within this small collection. The Grand Mistress was also to wear a large pair of spectacles. Each lady was to be accompanied by an aide, and the Grand Mistress also had a kitchen maid to help. The installation document details lots of necessary admonitions and speeches, and a significant amount of curtsying to each other was required. The Order also had a champion, who appears to have been a relation of the Grand Mistress, perhaps a brother whose job was to challenge anyone who had malicious intent against the Order. It is said that the champion would defend the Order in mortal combat. Within the Needle case also survives the rules of the Order. There are only seven rules, with the first being that the companions are never to be idle above four hours in a day or out of humour for want of employment. As the Order's motto says, idleness is the mother of mischief. The seventh rule is a little more unusual. The companions are not to take snuff unless they wear spectacles. Spectacles clearly had some sort of special significance for the ladies of the order. Continuing my search, I found a few more needlework items, including two embroidered bookmarks. The first bookmark, reference UDP 11-1, came to the archives amongst various papers relating to Victorian art critic and writer John Ruskin. It is a fairly fragile item, stored in a fraying fabric envelope. It is a simple design, embroidered with the phrase, God be with you, the date and the initials J.R., presumably for John Ruskin. Sadly, we do not know who made it, but they must have had a fondness for Ruskin to embroider such an item and message for him. The second bookmark, 
can be found amongst the papers of Charles Ammon, MP, and his wife, Lady Ada. Charles was a Labour MP, and although it is not clear who made the bookmark or who it was made for, the clear Christian message chimes with Charles's strong Christian upbringing. The final needlework item I found was this one of needlework samples sewn by an Annie Davis whilst attending Miss Rawson's school in Hessel in 1884. A short note kept with the samples states that Annie was aged 11 when she sewed the pieces and that she later married a George Allman and had children. Two other quirky items to find in an archive are these two knitting patterns, one for a cap and one for a shoe. Not being a knitter myself, these patterns are a foreign language to me. But if there are any knitters out there who would like the challenge of trying to bring these early 19th century patterns to life, then do let us know. I also found this knitting pattern, this time for a beret, amongst the teaching notes contained within a needlework notebook produced by a teacher at St John's School, Kenilworth. Dating from 1917 to 1918, I wonder if it's any more decipherable to the knitters watching than the patterns for the cap and shoe. The final handmade item I found in the archives was not sewing or knitting related, but carved from wood. In fact, it's a Zulu wooden carving dating from 1948 and given as a gift to Audrey Jupp Thomas. A socialist, pacifist and anti-colonialist, Jupp Thomas worked tirelessly throughout her life for various left-wing organisations, including the Union of Democratic Control and the Socialist Medical Association. This carving must have been important to her, since it survived to be retained within her archives held here at the Hull History Centre. One particularly popular craft nowadays is scrapbooking. But did you know that scrapbooking is not a modern invention? In fact, the history of scrapbooking can be traced back hundreds of years. Early forms of scrapbooking can be seen in the use of commonplace books and family Bibles to record and store important information and documents. Commonplace books initially rose to prominence in the 15th century and continued to be popular for several centuries. They were comprised of any information of interest to the compiler, including recipes, quotations, poetry and personal correspondence. Generally, such information was copied by hand into the book rather than the original document being pasted in. As mass printing developed and more families were able to afford books, a family Bible might be used in a similar fashion, with important dates recorded at the front and printed items such as birth and death announcements stored between the pages. Some later Bibles even included slots for family photographs. A nice example of a commonplace book and how they could cross over with diaries is the one compiled by Sarah Caroline Buthakar, which can be found at reference UDX 64-2. Begun in 1809 on her 20th birthday, the small volume consists mainly of copies of riddles and poems that she enjoyed. From around 1830, the book continues as a diary, with each page generally relating to one year. Brief mentions are made of key events of the year, including births, marriages, deaths, accidents, and major visits she made or received. In 1838, she notes she went to Queen Victoria's coronation. And if anyone is able to decipher the riddles in this image, please get in touch. As industrial printing increased further, enabling the widespread dissemination of a range of printed ephemera, the popularity of keeping such memorabilia naturally increased. At first, memorabilia like greetings cards, calling cards, postcards, tickets and programmes were included in diaries. But by the 19th century, blank notebooks and sketchbooks, separate to diaries, 
were being used to retain and conserve these items. Like diaries and journals, scrapbooks can be kept daily or produced for certain occasions like, like holidays. In some cases, scrapbooks may be produced when planning special events, such as weddings. Scrapbooks, particularly through the use of newspaper cuttings, can also be used to document the work of a particular individual or company, or can be based on a specific subject. Similar to diaries, they can provide historians with invaluable insights into the creator's life, including daily activities, family life and friendships, as well as providing evidence of changing cultural attitudes, current affairs and the roles of particular groups within society, such as women, for example. There are many excellent examples of scrapbooks held in the archives at Hull History Centre. One example of a business scrapbook is that kept by John Goodenson's Shipping Limited, now at reference UDGO 20. John Goodenson's has been active in Hull since the 1830s, building successful trade links with various Baltic and Scandinavian countries. The scrapbook contains press adverts, correspondence and information about costs. This particular page includes adverts for passenger services on the Finland line, with trips available to Helsinki, Copenhagen, Stockholm and Tallinn, amongst other destinations. A common type of ephemera pasted into scrapbooks is newspaper cuttings. Keeping newspaper cuttings can be a useful way of recording and keeping track of campaigns and events, such as those organised by the Association of British Counties, a society dedicated to promoting awareness of the continuing importance of the 86 historic or traditional counties of Great Britain. The scrapbook shown in this image details efforts to redraw the Yorkshire County boundaries after the local government reorganisation of 1974. This included protests against the formation of Humberside and the fight to return to the separate counties of the East Riding of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. Of course, most scrapbooks kept today are of a personal nature, containing ephemera, pictures and photos that are meaningful to the creator. A fine example of this type of scrapbook is that at reference UDAS 29 22, which dates from 1860 onwards. Part of the papers of Colonel Rupert Alexander Alex Smith, a well known supporter of local history and particularly of Hull and the East Riding's Georgian heritage, the scrapbook unfortunately gives no clues as to who created it. A good guess, however, would assume one of the Colonel's ancestors kept it. It mainly comprises of newspaper cuttings relating to South Holderness, but also includes illustrations and cartoons that the creator presumably enjoyed. These two cartoons have sadly been damaged, but thankfully the amusing ditties is still legible. And the scrapbook's creator clearly enjoyed this illustration for the rhyme, The Middler of the D, as a whole series of similarly illustrated rhymes were pasted onto the following pages. Another beautiful example of a personal scrapbook is the one kept by Lady Frances Hotham, stored at reference UDDHO 20 56, which dates from circa 1829. It contains many delightful illustrations, some pasted in, some drawn directly into the book and with some perhaps collected on foreign travels, such as these extremely detailed images from Asia, which appear to have been painted on something similar to rice paper. There are also two examples of multi-textural portraits, including one of the Duke of Wellington in his red coat army uniform, as well as a pressed flower, which is remarkably largely intact considering its age. I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of arts and crafts in the archives and perhaps even feel inspired to start your own creative journey. Thanks for watching and please keep an eye out for our next stories from the Strong Room video, which will be available next month.